Hi, everyone. Welcome to the TimingResearch.com Crowd Forecast News, episode number 256 for March 16th, 2020. Uh, my name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of TimingResearch.com, and today we will be discussing the 338 weekly reports and talking about the uh, the exciting times in the markets that we're seeing today uh, and the last few weeks and uh, what uh, my guests for, for this week are expecting to, to happen in the future. So uh, today I have arranged for uh, Neil Batho, Michael Villagera, John Thomas, and the option professor to join us. And uh, Jim, the option professor, is moderating. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Okay, great. Thank you, David. And uh, great to have everybody here. The Obviously, the markets are absolutely gone mad in the last uh, few weeks. And so it'd be interesting to hear what everybody's take is on what's happening now and what they think might uh, unfold. Uh, before we get started, for people who are new to the broadcast, I think it's important we introduce everybody. So let's start out at the top of the list here with Neil Batho of TraderReview.net. Hey, Neil, uh, how about a little background on yourself and a little Bit, uh, a little bit about trader review. Uh, sure, thanks a lot. Um, well, let's see. I was a broker in 98, 99 after college, and I thought it was going to be the job for me, super exciting. And I quickly found out that it's just a job of selling. And really, it's not about making the picks because they want to put everyone funds, private money managers, and, and stuff like that. So I had some wonderful lunches that mutual funds bought me, and um, it was a great time to learn about the business. So I know what side of the business what that side of the business is all about. And uh, after that, I, I quit. Uh, I'm not really a sales guy. I went into some business consulting and then I started up my newsletter. I like to use my experience from that. I got a finance degree before that. And then um, sending out my picks to clients um, using something I actually learned when I was a broker, well, actually was introduced to, which is point and figure charting, which I have used to time every collapse um, since I've ever started my newsletter. So I send out all these things to my clients. It'll be great to hear your input uh, as we get through the questions here. Uh, next up is... Uh... Uh, Michael uh, Villagera, and that's of Logical Signals. Michael, background on yourself, and of course, uh, what's happening at local, uh, Logical, I'm sorry, Logical Signals. LogicalSignals.com. <clears throat> well, there's not much happening at Logical, <clears throat> excuse me, LogicalSignals.com, so I need to take a sip of water. Um, <clears throat> But uh, I have been an options market maker. I started in 1979 here on the Pacific Exchange in San Francisco. I've also traded in London on the London traded options market. And I've traded in Amsterdam and in um, Germany on the DTB. Um, when I returned to the, back to the United States, I went back down to the PCX and didn't stay very long because uh, markets tended to be going more electronic. So in that vein, I left the floor, sold my seat, and came home and been there. I've been here ever since. Um, currently, I am day trading futures, and I'm finding that in the current market conditions, that is more of the ticket than to attempt to try to control positions. Um, Logical6.com continues to exist, but trading is really keeping me very, very busy. So not doing much over there as I probably should, but uh, that's it. Okay. Thank you, Michael. And uh, again, uh, uh, up next, Next is uh, John Thomas, and John, of course, is familiar to many of you, but for the uninitiated, John, a background on yourself and a little bit about the Mad Hud, uh, Bad Hedge Fund trader. I've uh, been in the market 50 years, uh, was the head of a trading desk at Morgan Stanley, uh, ran my own hedge fund for 10 years. Uh, we are global long short macro, which means we are looking for long and short ideas in every asset class all the time. Uh, we had big shorts in oil earlier in the year year and we were even shorting the stock market close to the highs. So uh, we, uh, you can find us at www.madhedgefundtrader.com. We have uh, daily newsletters, biotech letters, technology letters, daily hot tips, everything you need to stay in touch with this market uh, and stay ahead of it. And as of now, we're down only single, small single digits on the year in our performance. So uh, madhedgefundtrader.com is where you go to find out more about it. Okay, sounds great. Uh, normally we go through questions here. Uh, they almost seem laughable in some respects, but uh, I don't know if you guys want to give a go at it or not. The first question is normally on a Monday, uh, where do you think the S&P will end the week? And well, the this environment... laughable, first laughable thing about that is nor the word normally. <laughs> right, right, right. So obviously- I, I, I think, think we're in another great depression. Okay. Uh, 
may only last uh, a couple of months, but depression it is. Economic activity has totally ceased across the United States, and the markets are reflecting that. And you know where the final bottom is is anyone's guess. Mm -hmm. But you know it's a chip shot whether we bottom out at down 40 percent, which we could hit today or or tomorrow, or down 50 percent, which was the uh, 09 crash bottom. Uh, and until then, you just want to be selling every single rally. All right. That's uh, that's uh, definitely a point of view. Let's uh, roll it over to Neil. Neil, what's your view on this thing? Don't ask. Yeah, really. Uh, well, you know, uh, I, I had a guy, he, he wrote me several times, a doctor, and I'm pretty sure doctors are, some are really good at managing their money, like the guy in the big shirt, Michael Burry, big short, but uh, he, he kept writing me, should I sell? And then I, I just said, look, man, I'm not buying. Finally sold. So one of the things that you might want to do around your office is look for the person who is the least experienced in the whole office and see when they sell. And then uh, when they sell, it's really going to be close to the bottom. Uh, this is called socioeconomics. If you have want to have some fun to look up socioeconomics, economics, find some cool YouTube videos, but yeah, I'm gonna have to say down because I have to give an answer. You know, yeah. I think yeah. you know. Well, let, let's go through. Let's go through the uh, um, uh, reasons uh, as soon as we get everybody's uh, view here. Yeah, I'm just, I'm uh, just... One last uh, view up on uh, on the block here is Michael. Michael, uh, what are you thinking right now? But only until two. Lower. That's when the shorts rally. Lower. All right, now John, you gave us some of the ideas why you uh, think uh, that the market is in big trouble and sell every rally. Obviously, you know we are on lockdown, and obviously companies' <laughs> revenues are gonna drop. You know, one thing I uh, uh, read was that, or I saw on TV, actually, a guy getting interviewed from Adidas. Uh, he said in China, he lost 85% of his uh, revenue. It was 90%. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, hey, listen, I'm trying to be nice, John. Uh, I'm a I'm a kinder, gentler guy here. You're, you're the uh, so anyway, yeah, okay, 85, 90%, but that's a huge number. And uh, I guess uh, the point being is, is uh, are we ready when, the, when we announce numbers and if they even smell like either Japan's 7.7% uh, .7 GDP uh, contraction or companies saying that their revenues are down there and uh, what will the market uh, possibly do at that point you know uh, Neil uh, do you have I any think there's on? only one number now that makes a difference that's uh -huh. the number of new corona cases right that all people are seeing. Yeah. let right. me tell you why I was late to the webinar this morning okay it's I got a call from the Pentagon the Marine Corps Commandant they asked me to be on standby to, to work as a pilot because they're thinking about closing all state borders mm. now what happens if that becomes public you know it may be just a war game it may be just just a rumor. This right. is not bullish news for the stock market. I'm sorry. No, no. And again, uh, the stock market does have a valuation. And ergo, if you have no idea what the E is on PE, and this has been very well known. So, I mean, people who are, you know, still in the market hanging on for dear life, you know, they had choices such as change their asset allocation. You know, if you're 60, 40 stocks and you go 20, 80, you're going to have a lot less pain during this drop. And it's not very hard to switch from uh, 60, 40 to 20, 80 if you're in these index things. Second well, thing, is obviously, the is the uh, the, the yeah, collar strategy, sell, sell it out of the money, call, buy a put, and you would have had at least your money bracketed for a while. So there are tactics you need to take, uh, but if they're not taken, like any other situation, there's jeopardy to that, right? Yeah. Well, this is the great vindication of the balanced portfolio. You know, 50% bonds, 50% you had that portfolio in your bacon until now, yeah. but that strategy is now over. It's finished. Yeah. You can't have 50% of your portfolio in something that yields zero or close to it. Right. So from here on, we're going to see like maybe a 50%, you know, cash portfolio and 50% stocks. Yeah. Not only that, uh, the bond part of your portfolio that has offset some of the risk of the stock, dro a stock drop is probably not going to give you much of a buffer. So from 2,500 to 2,200 or 2,000 or wherever the heck this thing's going, is going to be a little bit on the unprotected side, right? And people just lost lost their natural hedge. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, Michael, uh, any input on, like I say, what you're seeing, what you're feeling, a little bit more specific than the one-word answer that we just got out of you, bud? Yes, sir. <laughs> that was good, Jim. Um, I have talked often on this show and on other shows that the status quo is what really people are hanging on to. The status quo has been broken, and therefore, all bets are off in terms of, well, what do we do? I'm in it for the long term, so I'm just going to continue to buy it on the way down because markets always recover. The status quo is broken, folks. We're into a new situation, and that situation we've never been in before. In our lifetime, we have never dealt with a pandemic.
pandemic that's absolutely sweeping the country that is totally unprepared for it. So until we actually get more information, the only thing that we're going to see is people getting out. It's bailing time. And so that's what I think is happening. Now, on the converse of that is that when they jump in and decide to buy, we're seeing humongous moves. So the swings in the market are in well in excess of four to 500 points in a single move. So in other words, they start buying it like they did on Friday. That market jumped a thousand bucks in the Dow. That's a huge amount of money to be pushing in one direction or another. So I think we need to just kind of take a step back, realize if indeed you didn't do anything, your time to do it is, is gone. So as I heard a few people already say, your best position right now, you move it into cash because at least your money is now, you know what you got versus leaving it somewhere and not knowing what you have and what you don't have. I like some of the things you mentioned, Jim, is that, you know, if you're going to try to play the market, then you've got to jump in with puts or calls and you've got to be very nimble about it as well. But if you're that, a long-term that game, player, that game, that game and, certainly is a uh, very poor timing at this point too, though. You know, like I say, it's, it's, absolutely. I agree with you. Uh, I agree. You know, so that's why if you're, if you're in there now, you really advice, just have to figure out what your time horizon uh, is. If you have a right, very long time horizon, you could maybe stick it out. Obviously, if you have a short time horizon, that makes it more difficult. I agree with you. But even long-term players, it's like you got to rethink about what you're doing here because we don't have any clue, a true clue, as to what type of damage to the economy and to earnings is really going to be. We have an so the clue. The clue obviously comes out of China. So obviously, the clue comes out of Adidas uh, minus 90% on their revenue. But their stores are now open and uh, it has been very slow to come back. But obviously, you know, at some point, things open. So again, the, the real uh, the but real thing here is, is, is this going to be a deal where uh, by June uh, we're contained and by uh, Q3 and Q4, there's some return to something. That's the big By Q3 there. and Q4, Jim, we would be right back into it because the next wave is going to hit next fall. Yeah, well, I mean, like I say, these are all the one side of the story and I've been around long enough and you guys have been around long enough to know there's always two sides to the story. And if everyone is betting right. on the one, if everyone bets on the one side of the story, like they were at 3,400, right. and obviously anybody, uh, I think all the panel here was well aware that that 3,400 number with no GDP growth and no earnings growth was a Fugazi. Then obviously yeah. down here, yeah. you've got to also remember that, um, you know, when it gets uh, low enough and the panic is big enough that, uh, you know, obviously you got to at least start peeking at the other side of the trade. What's very interesting to me you. right now and many of the listeners, let's just uh, get to Neil. And Neil, what's the point in figure charts telling you? So I have something called the bullish band. That's what I use. And, and if you know how game of football works and for all our international people, I'm talking about American football, um, the stock market is exactly exactly like a football, you know, you're on your own 10 yard line, it's first down. Are you going to do a running play? Probably not, right? You're going to throw a pass. And you're getting about, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 yards away. You're on your third down, you're near the end zone. And you go, oh God, I don't want to throw a pass. Could get intercepted. The guy's going to run all the way back, right? So um, I use something called bullish percent. It goes, it's a score from zero to a hundred and it will measure what percent of stocks in the S&P 500 or any other uh, index are on a near term buy signal. Okay. So the weak ones will fall off first. So we we were at about 80%, which is very, very high. And it starts to move down 6%. That's a reversal. And and now when I checked it, it was at, I believe, three. Mm. Only 3% of stocks in S&P 500 won a near-term breakout. And today, I'm guessing it's got to be basically zero, which even at the financial crisis, I think it was like three or four. And in all of history, that's, I mean, you can't go below zero. So that's that's amazing. So when that ticks up, um, it's not a real bull market until it goes above 30, because there's going to be a lot of shakiness at the bottom. But when that breaks out off the bottom, I mean, you're in from massive boom, just massive. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I called this, you know, a few days before it happened. I said, or no, actually, I missed that last boom. So almost two weeks before it happened, just because this reversed down and that's when I get really sketched out and we bought bonds. So, but now I'm just going to wait till it reverses. Yeah. yeah um, at this point, uh, are you looking for that 3% number to start rising before you'd be interested in taking a bite out of anything? Yeah, it has to move 6% to reverse. But okay. you know what? If you miss the exact bottom, not that important. It goes above 30%, you're right. still going to pay. Yeah. No, you don't. It's much better to see if you got a turn probably before you get in there. Uh, John, I wanted to ask you a question on these banks. Um, what I'm hearing, and tell me what you think, uh, is that uh, people, well, many of the banks are trading underneath a tangible book. Uh, uh, I heard uh, JP Morgan has to get down to 60 to get to tangible book. 
Uh, and they're saying that people are a little overzealous of the negativity because the loan demand is going to make them a lot of money. They're making a lot of money on the bid offers with the trading because they're so wide. And they're also uh, the free um, interest uh, margin is not as bad as people have outlined. So do you see um, those as uh, the light at the end of the tunnel on these banks? Or do you think like a tangible book on Citicorp is supposed to be about 60, it's trading at 40. Is that a screaming buy here? or it, uh, It's not. You know, okay. we've been of the view that legacy banks are going out of business. They'll okay. be replaced by fintech. Right. This whole uh, national quarantine greatly accelerates to move to online commerce of all sorts. Uh, and uh, certainly financial transactions are a big part of that. Uh, also, interest rates are going to be a lot lower for a lot longer. Banks do terrible in that situation. Mm -hmm. And having run a bank trading desk myself at Morgan Stanley, I can tell you that even though the spreads are wide, they have cut the capital allocation to the trading desk way back by like a half or three quarters uh, to adjust for the risk. So, uh, you know, and also banks trading at huge discounts to net asset value. That's not a new thing. You know, they traded down to uh, 70, 80 uh, percent of book value during the crash. They stayed under 100 for about five years. And uh, it's only in recent years that you actually had banks trading above book value. So, uh, you know, too many other better things to buy than banks right here. You know, I think technology uh, is going to lead the recovery and it's also holding up the best. Um, you know, Apple's only down about 20% here. So uh, I would go with the big tech stocks. They will lead any recovery. Now, I also heard that Japanese uh, uh, communication stocks and Japanese uh, technology uh, um, stocks are very interesting here. Do you, uh, I, uh, State Street was saying that, um, which is generally not a terrible outfit, I don't think. Um, what do you, what do you, th are you any privy on that or is not something you're following or? You know, I, I've been out of Japan for so long. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything interesting in, in Japan. You know, the, the best mm -hmm. thing going on in Japan for a long time was SoftBank and it's just vaporized. So, uh, you know, whatever you find in Japan, there's almost always something 10 times better uh, to do in the U.S. How about that uh, India Yes Bank? Uh, you can you can buy it, but you can't sell it. They call it the Hotel California trade. And uh, well, there's some a people... lot of those. You know, approximately 20% of the entire Japanese stock market are zombie companies, which are de facto bankrupt. Uh, and the banks just relend them their interest uh, uh, every year so they don't default and they can count those as good assets. Now, uh, are you just one last thing before I move over to Michael um, on the uh, banks? Are you indicating that your feeling is is that uh, Deutsche Bank and Societe Generale could be a blueprint on what could happen to our banks in this uh, zero interest rate environment? Which means a uh, sixty dollar uh, Deutsche Bank goes to five, and uh, Societe Generale goes from fifty down to fourteen. I mean, do you think it could get uh, that? Uh, no, this is in no way a financial crash. You know, you're not having big. Uh, debt problems going on with the banks. You don't have anywhere near the leverage that you had in 08. Uh, you know, banks essentially can handle two coronavirus epidemics and still be okay on a capital basis. And if you notice, they're not begging for bailouts. No capital, no equity infusion, none of that. So these European banks are much different than our banks from the standpoint they of they're fighting a slow economy took, and no interest? Yeah, they always took on uh, much uh, more risk, lesser credits than right. American banks. Banks did and like the more, Trump organization, for and example. that's more the reason why they've hit the skids uh, more so than just the slowdown in the GDP in Europe and the fact that uh, interest rates are at zero or negative. Well, those are all factors. You know, it's yeah. hard to grow in an in an economy that has essentially zero growth or under one percent growth. Right. Zero interest rates or negative interest rates for years now right. have a huge drag on the banking system. That's right. why they're stumbling all over each other to lend to American companies. There's right. nobody to lend to in Europe. All right, I'm going to switch over to Michael here, get him in here. And uh, Michael, I know you follow the metals. So why don't you give an opinion on what's going on there? Because obviously we've gone broken out from 1350, ran up to 1700. And now we're back in the uh, 1400s. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously, the there's a deflation and strong dollar thing that's kind of choking it right now. Plus, some people are saying uh, people have profits in that. So they got to take some profits there to throw them at all these losses. I mean, what are you thinking? Right, right which I think is just it's true. True, I think that is exactly what people are doing. But to tell you the truth, what what really is behind these pushes in in the metals, I think is again this is what status.
status quo. This is what we always do. This is what we do during this. So I think that that experience in going through a move like we're going is very, very limited because I don't know about the other panelists, but I was not alive in 1918. I was not alive during some of the other big uh, crises when it came to um, what affected the general population versus a financial meltdown. But I will add, I, I don't necessarily agree, Jim, uh, John, with what you were saying about the banks. These big banks, and I'm going to Citigroup, I'm going to Bank of America, and I'll start with Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, are up to their earlobes in loans that they made, billions of dollars with the loans that they made to the oil producers in this country. With, well, with as far as that's concerned, that, there's one bank, I think it might be J.P. Morgan, who's 7% exposure, but the other bank's exposure to the oil patch is under 5%. That's what I saw on TV. And it, that's if you believe that they're telling you the truth. Right. Well, that's right. Okay. But so if that's my, true, my, that, if my that's my true then they're not going to get whacked as much by the oil. But if really? it's untrue- J.P. Morgan's gone from 140 to 90. Well, the whole board's come down. That's for sure. Well, I call that being whacked. Yeah. But that's probably, it might not be from oil. But anyway, you might be right. And these numbers are incorrect. And so, uh, yeah, you're saying that the banks could We're be vulnerable from that area. We're talking about risk exposure, right? Yeah. There's a lot of risk exposure. Here's what I wanted to talk to you about back on the point, though, Mike. Michael, I want to give you a little point here. A GDX today hit 16 and change, and now it's trading at 21. That's a 30% jump off of the low today. Uh, it, and the gold went down to that somewhat support zone, right? 1350, 1450. I'm yeah. wondering if uh, there was a little bit of a tide change, or this is just a little short covering rally. Because, I'm not uh, sure. To tell you the truth in gold, I'm not sure. I continue to have my, my core position is in gold, and I'm long. Yeah. And I've been long for a very long time. Time. But I will tell you, <laughs> when it zipped up to uh, to 1700 and started to come back off, I put my hedges back on. When it broke 1650, right. I put my hedge on there. When it broke right. 1600, I put additional hedges on. Right. Um, and now that it's sitting down here, I have to really consider, well, do I think that this is going to gonna find, form a bottom here and continue to rally on the fact of what's really happening versus, you know, the little interim thing that happens with people selling. I've heard the same thing. Um, you know, the the, the fact that, well, interest rates and et cetera, et cetera. So therefore gold has to, gold gets punished because it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have that long, it doesn't pay any benefits other than just being long and you make money or you short and you make money. So well, if, yeah, the fact that there's no interest out there is obviously a positive for gold because you're not forfeiting interest uh, income right. when there's no income coming. Right. So that's, that's a good thing that for that, gold. That's not, that's being absorbed by the sellers. I mean, gold was down 70 bucks this morning. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, this, which doesn't make sense because because the coronavirus reports are getting worse. We still don't know exactly what's going to happen. So I think if you start to filter in everything, it, it will settle out and I think it will resume an uptrend. All right. Um, I'd like to throw the gold question to uh, Neil and John. Neil first, uh, you know, uh, obviously there's obviously powerful deflationary forces out there. <laughs> so, I mean, PPI and CPI uh, probably are going to be pretty uh, uh, shocking numbers when they come out, particularly PPI. So, Neil, what do you, uh, what do you think of gold down here? Because that was a pretty big moved uh, today from 16 to 21 on 46 million shares in GDA. Uh, is the point and figure telling you anything on gold that we could work with? Well, you know, uh, I'm going to go to something I remember from a long time ago in the financial crisis. Uh, Jim Rogers was on CNBC. Um, you know, I was a big Jim Rogers fan back then. I actually had my client buying his agricultural ETF. Um, he, he really got it wrong in the end because he'd sell. But um, when they start pumping massive amounts of money into the system, people think, oh, you know, you inject a lot of money in the system. It's, it's fake money. It's going to make prices go up. And that's true. You know, but at the beginning when they do it, people just aren't going to buy. The prices don't go up, you know? So there was this guy from the show, CNBC or Bloomberg or something, accusing Jim Rogers saying, what you are saying is false. They're injecting money and prices go down. And Jim is just rolling his eyes going, there is no such thing ever that you inject billions and trillions of dollars and prices don't go up or inflation doesn't go up, right? So don't confuse prices with inflation because the Fed just says it's the same thing, but it's not because the inflation will come when prices prices just naturally go up when economic activity becomes normal again and people start going out and shopping and buying stuff. And, and uh, the consumer gets re-leveraged with the lower interest rates and housing cars, et cetera, credit cards, et cetera. So, and, and that's when gold is going to move, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the price of gold is a nice suit in New York. That's kind of like what it is, you know? Um, so, you know, you would think, okay, I mean, the Fed could pump a trillion dollars tomorrow. I don't, I don't think gold is going to move, but it's going to move at some point, you know? So you have to keep your eye on it, right? That, thir people, that, 13, people, yeah, that 1350 breakout point where we went to all the way up to 1700. Uh, that would be a reasonable line in the sand if you wanted to remain somewhat positive on gold, right? You know, 
because uh, sometimes not. it comes back to the breakout point. People are yes, more interested I would agree in with that. right now than gold. Cash mm -hmm. is cash, you know. Yeah. Uh, but again, getting back to the point and figure, do you have any information on that, or you're not really tracking it uh, point and figure wise on the gold? Um, I I look. Um, I also use the uh, Ichimoku cloud. Yeah. Well, that's going to be a pretty uh, ominous cloud now. <laughs> I, I don't think I don't think we can show screenshots on here. Yeah. Are we showing screenshots on here, or no, or we're not? I don't no, we're doing so. It's because it's, uh, it's audio. audio only. It's audio only, so they'd have okay, to be able so to see that. with their ears. <laughs> um, yeah, I wouldn't buy it here. It broke a cloud, and yeah. you know, I mean, maybe some people are thinking about you know taxes and stuff. So that's another thing to think about. But you know, if gold drops further, like down to twelve hundred, or if it really really sells off like it did in two thousand eight, that came an awesome buy, mm -hmm. right? So and then it can rally again higher, right? But uh, I mean, no, I'm just into cash. I'm not even into bonds right now. We we bought some bonds when everything was crashing, but even bonds aren't going to save you at this point. Only cash, you know. Well, some of the some of the short term funds were having some liquidity issues, like Vanguard's VCSH last week. It dropped about five percent, and it and uh, according to reports, the Fed's uh, injection of funds is trying to shore up things. You know, Treasury market number one, then the short term stuff and uh, commercial paper and then go on the list. But John, getting to you, because you have got a lot of experience in the um, in the gold. Uh, yeah, I date back to $32 an ounce. <laughs> <laughs> We're going back to the Nixon uh, 1973 price. Huh? Uh, four. I I thought you were gonna, hey, Jim, yeah. I thought you were going to steal my thunder for a second there, but look up on Wikipedia. There's a quote, we are all Keynesians now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's no <laughs> doubt that about my that. my quote or yours? You're right. That's on, that's on Wikipedia. You can look it up. And it was, I got to think, I think it was Nixon didn't want to pump a bunch of money because he's like, no, you know, that's socialism, you know, and yeah. it is. I mean, a central bank is socialism, for God's sake, you know, but um, but if you don't pump in the next election, you're going to get dumped. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Well, anyway, regarding gold, uh, you know, long term, the fundamentals look great. Uh, right now, fund fundamentals uh, and technicals are completely uh, meaningless. Uh, you have a full on panic happening yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you're getting huge margin calls on everything. So people right. are telling their winners to finance their losers uh, and that means selling of gold. I mean, right. they're also selling to big tech stocks for the same reason. So uh, that's what's going on there. Uh, the good news is that if you miss the gold move in the last year or two, you're going to get another bite at the apple. Uh, you know, like everything else, uh, you should be lining up a short list of names to pile into once corona cases peak out and gold would be one of them. You know, if you can get gold back into the 1400s, the 1300s, the 12 hundreds it would be a, you know a gift so uh, and some of these and then some of these tech stocks john i think you make a very good point uh, you know a lot of people do think uh, that it will lead us out and microsoft just today finally today uh went down and uh, pierced its 200 day moving average so um you know uh these tech stocks certainly have had a very difficult time uh, getting sold off compared to the rest of the market yeah and um, up quite well yeah they, i mean re realistically i mean you know they had a hard time well they were very overbought so obviously they had to have a pullback as everything did and now um, that pullback has occurred and you've uh, at least gone back Apple the same thing wasn't the 200 day average around 240 yeah 245 and I think that's yeah. uh, a little bit perished it now uh, well, well no, Apple, still above it's still above it 254 so you're still yeah, not even Apple at the 200 day average on these things Apple is 253 right now it has yeah. a market cap of 1.3 trillion but 250 billion of that is cash yeah <laughs> yep. so how far down are they going to sell this thing when it has so much cash on the balance sheet yeah, and Google is another one uh, laden with cash, correct? Yeah, Google, Microsoft also has enormous amounts of cash. Yeah. And, yeah I got, uh, I got, oh, sorry. We got, no, go on, Neil, please. I was just going to say that I came up with a little bit of schadenfreude when you were talking about Apple, because I'm just for some reason really, really happy Warren Buffett is losing money. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, well, he's he's losing Buffett. money, but what's he going to do with all that cash, John? He, waited he owns Apple 10 for, well, Warren Buffett is going to be oh, buying God. like crazy. And <laughs> that, you know, he has, Warren Buffett has $120 billion in cash, and right. he's out on him putting almost all of that work yep. fairly soon. You know, we're getting, you know, he's been shut out of this market for the last five years. Right. Everything was too expensive. Now everything is back in his budget again. So right. he, yes, and he went out and bought and just came industrial. back and said he's gotten the old one-two punch. Yeah. yeah. And also, so, uh, I don't he's know. already at his maximum position on 
example. So, right, Jim, yeah. I wanted to add one thing. You yeah. brought up an extremely good point, and there's still a lot of technical trading going on. Gold, on, on, I pulled up my long term, so that's a monthly chart. The 50 day moving average on a monthly basis comes in at 1350. Yeah. So, I, I, as soon as you mentioned that, I went over and I took a look at it. I thought, boy, that, that truly is a, 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 at least a resting point, if not a stopping point to kind of get things turned around again. Now, just technically speaking, gold made a beautiful ABC Elliott, ABC, this is again on the monthly chart, up to 1700. So whether that stopped the rally, that finished the rally, yet to be seen, but if we're going to go on a purely technical basis, gold's going to drop below 1000 before all is said and done. Now, we have too many other factors jumping in here that are going to keep the markets active and alive. So I think if we, we need to pay attention to our uh, moving averages, and we need to pay attention to the overall structure of how this is coming off on uh, because it, it, it could have just been a corrective bounce and this would have been off of on the long term chart off of the 26 uh, 2015 lows the December 2015 lows is what that rally from that point which was 1035 up to 1700 was nothing more than a corrective rally and now the market's going to put another larger five waves down and have to end below 11 1000 uh, excuse me yes 1040 that'll finish it and then you're going to get that big huge rally that, that we're all hoping for now. All right, let's so. go around the horn here and get a couple of different markets and get an idea of what you guys think. Uh, let's talk, uh, uh, Neil, we'll start with you. Uh, U.S. dollar. Obviously, it was going in the tank, went down to 95, which is obviously the support for the last year or so. And then boom, it went right back up to uh, almost 99. It's at 98 now. 100 seems to be a pretty good uh, line in the sand. Uh, we're kind of, you know, just meandering between 100 and 95. What do you see uh, coming out of the dollar now that the interest rate differential has gone out the window a bit. Yeah, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to mention some currencies today. But um, a few we're weeks ago. We're going to mention everything today, Neil. This is a no holes barred seminar. <laughs> okay, you're not going to mention that thing, though, that we talked about before. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, uh, we, uh, where am I going to? So a few weeks ago, Dollar, yeah. something happened with the German, I think it, it's the bank that used to run the, the German mark, but now they don't, but it's not the ECB. Anyway, um, they are loosening their budget constraints, which means they can go deeper into deficit. And that actually made the euro rally counterintuitively for a while. But then Boris Johnson proved that he's a massive Keynesian. Uh, I think he's doing something like, oh my God, it's just a massive amount he's he's pumping into yeah. the economy and that the pound just tanked. Mm -hmm. uh, but something you want to really look at is the Canadian dollar. Because mm. I remember 20 years ago when a US dollar peaked at a dollar sixty Canadian. The Canadian dollar was like a wimpy 63 cents. And the entire Whistler parking lot was full of Washington lights for seeing, right? Um, now a U.S. dollar will get to a dollar thirty-nine. It's just a tiny bit below a dollar forty, but it could easily go up to a dollar fifty-five, dollar sixty. Don't fool around around the dollar forty range. Wait till it hits like maybe dollar forty-one, forty-one and a half. And I think we're going to get a one forty to one fifty. You can make a huge amount of money because if you look at Canada now, it's literally a complete joke because you got a prime minister whose previous job was I am not kidding you, substitute drama teacher. Okay, um, he's completely against oil, and oil runs the Canadian economy. Right? Totally so does. Yeah. In in the previous government, the Canadian dollar reached a high of a dollar six American and went the other way for a time in like 30 years. So now it's the opposite. A lot of unemployment. Even Trump's son made a joke about some Twitter thing about the amount of jobs lost, like 200,000 jobs lost one month. And he says, that'd be like 2 million in America. Um, anyway, so yeah, I think there's a big, big opportunity there because no oil. Uh, Buffett pulled a liquid natural gas plant because of the railway blockades. Um, it's just a mess. So think about some big, big money to be made there. Uh, don't time the breakout, but I think buck forty-two wants to hit there. You're hitting the buck forty-five, buck forty-six up to a. And what do you, uh, what does that correspond to? Like sixty cents on the dollar? Uh, yeah, when it's a dollar sixty, when the U.S. dollar is a dollar sixty, if you reverse it, it's about sixty-three, sixty-four cents. Yeah, because uh -huh. uh, during uh, the two thousand two thousand five area, you did go down to sixty cents on the dollar. So you're thinking it's a possibility to revisit a sixty-five, sixty area? <laughs> yeah, but it's traded the other way, you know, U.S. to Canadian. So yeah, I'm just looking at the futures contract, and you know they. Expect Express yeah. it a different way. That's going to be a big one. And uh, the economies are pretty intertwined. So you're not going to get these crazy moves. Like, you know, if you're trading the pound with Boris Johnson, no one knows what he's going to do. You don't know what's going to happen. It's really a pr pretty predictable pair to trade yeah. with oil going down now. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a gimme. Uh, John, do you have an opinion on the dollar? Uh, yeah, it's done. You know, we had a multi-year uh, bull market based on the fact we had higher interest rates uh, than any 
then suddenly we became the country that was lowering its interest rates faster than anyone to the country that has zero rates like everyone. So I think the dollar is done now for several years and you want to be shorting every dollar rally against the euro, the yen, uh, the British pound, the Canadian dollar. Uh, the only and, thing the Sw- and the Swiss franc's pretty good probably, right? Yeah. Uh, well, the Swiss franc is a different story, but yeah. the only thing I wouldn't sell the, you know, uh, I'd especially be buying Australian dollars down here. Oh, yeah. Uh, because they'll be the first to recover on any corona slowdown. Yeah, the New Zealand dollar, Canadian dollar, they're getting down to, you know, really, really low levels. I mean, they get down to 50 cents on the dollar. You know, it's uh, twice the money that we have. That sounds like a lot. Yeah, uh, it's, I think it's it's a short, it's been a long play for years. And uh, the last month or so, it's been a, a short play and quite a good one. So yeah, you're right now you're at 60 cents on the dollar. You're at, right now you're at 60 cents on the dollar on the Aussie and New Zealand. Certainly if it went down to 50 cents on the dollar, it'd be you know, very, very, uh, well, it did discount, very discounted in the 08 crash, but you know, 08 crash levels are on the table now for all asset classes. Yeah. And there's no doubt. Um, uh, Michael, your view on the dollar. Um, my view on the dollar is that it's going to go through its adjustment to what's happening. But I think that really, again, I'm just going to stress guys that the status quo is out the window. We're in new territory. This is all new. And so how markets react, I think, it's going to be very difficult to try to predict going out Well, this is going to happen or that's going to happen or something's done for the foreseeable future. Because again, we don't have enough facts to really be pushing things out too far. So I think it's like, yes, if you're going to play the dollar, you play it according to what's actually happening right in front of you. So I think that taking a long-term position in anything right now could be really dangerous unless you were willing to, as you do so, so eloquently, Jim, you talk about hedging, you talk about what they need to put in underneath or above to protect their money. And I think that's the correct way to move forward. Now, on the dollar, yeah, I think that it, it, it's going to find its levels. It's going to rally a little bit. But when we're talking about all the cross rates, the same thing that's happening here in the United States is happening everywhere else. So, you know, at what level do we want to jump in and across and say, particularly against the Aussie or the New Zealand, which seem to be more stable, but for how long? Right. Across the commodity board, it's all red ink except for three things, OJ, milk, and rice. So that's quite a meal you can put together there. But three uh, staples in everybody's house. Yeah. But uh, right now, I'd like to go on the price of crude oil. Now, I was uh, hearing today that uh, uh, they, they used the word vow uh, when it said Saudi vows to keep pumping oil. And then they also said that uh, uh, pre-dividend, Aramco is still profitable as long as oil's above 15. I had read that Russia loses money underneath 40. So that is obviously um, a very disruptive situation. And some people are saying temporarily, you could maybe get into the teens on oil. So I wanted yeah, to get yeah. a little bit of a, and um, obviously uh, the fra- uh, the <clears throat> shale guys and all that, you know, the defaults that could happen, consolidations. and uh, But they were saying uh, big companies like uh, Total and uh, Chevron uh, could come out the other side pretty well. So I just wanted to get an idea from you guys on what you think of crude oil down here. It's uh, in the 20s right now. Uh, Neil, start it with you, crude oil. You know, I've been looking at Exxon for a while. And did you know that Exxon is yielding 9.1% today? Yep. Um, and, and supposedly I'll... they're pretty solid financially for two years, even if it stays at this yeah. level. That's what they say anyway. I've heard that really? Too. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they, they may never drop. I mean, if they don't drop that dividend, I mean, yeah. that's a that's a pretty damn pretty good. Well, you get a disruptive market like oil, you should be getting a situation where the dividend should jump through the roof. And then, of course, if the stock recovers, you know, uh, even the aristocrats had very low yields, even though they were raising dividends all the time because the actual stock had gone through the roof. So, you know, this is a time, but uh, it's kind of nerve wracking when you see uh, the word vow and uh, pumping, but uh, you, you are uh, focused a little bit on Exxon. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just looking at the, uh, the one month chart of oil. I like to do that. Sometimes. Yeah. Good thing. You've just been looking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, <coughs> I mean, oil is denominated in, in us dollars and, and who really controls the price of oil. It's, it's supply and demand, but mm-hmm. also those house market makers in New York, you know, if they really want to drop it. They, 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 I, I, I thought uh, when Aramco came out and ran, the, they ran the price up to 66. Aramco dumped two and a half trillion dollars with a stock on the market. They mm-hmm. got paid. After they got paid, if you notice, they don't need to keep the price up anymore. Now it's time to go after the frackers. So you know, uh, Trump always says he's a good friend of the Saudis. Well, the good friend just ran oil up to 66, basically liquidated their Aramco company, and now they're going after our frackers. They don't sound like nice guys to me. Yeah, I worked in the oil industry for five years, so I can talk a little bit about this. And sure. 
what do you got? In the Middle East for 50 years. Uh, you knew that when Saudi Arabia was getting out of the oil business that you didn't want to be in it either. Uh, and that's what the Saudi Aramco deal was all about. And they didn't raise $2.5 trillion. They only actually raised about $23 billion. It was only about uh, uh, a tiny percentage of the company that was actually floated. You know, my target for oil is in the mid-teens. Saudi Arabia wants to do two things, wipe out the entire U.S. fracking industry and wipe out Russia. And oil in the mid-teens, if it stays there for more than a few weeks, will do exactly that. We think the Exxon dividend is ready to be cut in half at least. And what will happen is one oil company will cut their dividend and all the others will follow through at the same time. There's no way the Exxon is going to maintain a 9% dividend with oil at $25, $20, or $15 a barrel. Uh, What happens next is you've had uh, a, a depression in the U.S. is about to collapse. U.S. oil demand from 20 million barrels a day down to 15, uh, while the Saudis are ripping up their production from 11 million barrels a day to 13 million barrels a day. So there's an extra 7 million barrels a day of oil that nobody wants. And the end result of this could be not only a big chunk of U.S. energy going bankrupt, but another Russian revolution. I'll let you chew on that for a second. Yeah, no, I think you make very good points. I uh, I uh, have been hearing 15 to 20 is a target area uh, if they wanted to go down there. And like I said, that 15 number pre-dividend for Aramco as their line in the sand uh, is about the only company out there who that price is their line in the sand. Everybody else's line in the sand has gone uh, bye-bye a while ago. Uh, Michael, do you have a little in, just a little input from Michael on the oil? Uh, Michael? Uh, yes, actually I do. I sure. think that what we really got going on, and I won't use the original word I wanted to use, but we have a huge ego contest going on between uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia, their leaders. And it's, it's whoever's going to win that, but it's like two trillionaires trying to duke it out for the price of oil. Now, to just add a bit, I heard that uh, all the shale producers really need $50 a barrel or greater to continue doing what they're doing and to make any money. Therefore, being 20 bucks underneath that uh, really puts the pinch on the U.S. So, what I what I personally see happening is that 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 lack of a better word pissing contest that we see going between Saudi Arabia and Russia is going to continue, and then who's going to start to say, well, I'm going to sell it at 25 uh, 25 bucks a barrel, and on and on and on until we get it down. So, Jim, I agree with your number, 15 to t- mid 20s, I think can really happen, but I do see us going below the 2008 low, which is at 17 uh, and change. So, yeah. and I, and I think once that kind of goes through, we're going to then then oil might be you know, more interesting in terms of like picking up a position or doing something on the long side. But I think, it, it, and again, until we have more information on long-term effects, until we have, like John was mentioning, Exxon can have, will not keep a dividend in over nine bucks. It's, it's, it's like, give me a break or 9%. It's like, that, that's ridiculous. Right. You're, well, you're they have themselves in, in the ground. They so, haven't cut it in so many decades, though. I mean, they're, right. They're, well, no, no. I, but Neil, I think everybody's basing it on, you know, solid information. But again, it's a a new playing field right now. It's it's all new information. So how can we say with any certainty that they're going to hold on to it because it's drawing people to their stock? That's yeah. true. Yeah. So the, the, bet, the bet the bet that they're not going to cut is that we are looking at something that ends by Q2 and that the prices do a little bit of a snapback. And when they snap back, obviously, uh, you know, it might be helpful to them. So, so I is think that you, basically you, though, Jim? And, and I hear you, and I don't, I don't. Because you know, dark is before the dawn, or, or, or the non validity, but my my point is it's like people are caught the the general public is really caught in this mess and they're looking for please tell me anything that's going to make relieve my stress and anxiety about every time i log in and see that my 401k has gone down another hundred thousand dollars or whatever you know to just to bring it back so the 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 snap back thought and all this is you know we're looking at quarter two and maybe we'll have this all under control we don't know there's no no, you don't know but uh, you know historically they do try to dump the market as fast as possible. It achieves two purposes. One, it, it locks people in so they can't sell because it's too late to sell in their mind. And the second thing is, is they like to get as much blood on the street as possible so that they could start at least doing some kind of recovery. So if you're in mid-March and they really want to make the blood come all out of the body as fast as possible, then the month of April, May, and June could certainly be enough time for them to do that. And then, of course, wherever it lands, wherever it, land, 
whatever it lands by the end of June could be the base of which they try to rebuild from. But, uh, you know, like in the 2008, it didn't last at the low forever. In 2001, no. it didn't last at the low forever. And the True. drop obviously was precipitous. We're obviously involved in the precipitous. So the key here would be, in my mind, is that, you know, uh, if you looked at this thing in June and you had already spiked down to 1,800 or 2,200 on the S&P, you know, would that be the worst of it? And that would be um, the best case scenario at this point, maybe. You know what else? I agree with what you just said. I really don't. Um, again, well, I, 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 what I just said is a big guess. <laughs> but, yeah, but no, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I, I cannot disagree with that. You know, and trying to put rational thought into something that nobody has any kind of an idea what's going right. to happen. So that's my point. You made my point. Thank you. Yeah. But you know, you never know uh, when it's going to be hitting the low in 08. You know, you didn't know it was going to stop at six six seven or whatever it stopped at. You didn't know in 01 after dot com it was going to stop at a certain level. So you never know. The problem here right. is we're coming out of the uh, we're coming out of the um, top of the world trade uh, or the, the uh, Empire State Building, and well, there's a I lot of you, there's you, a lot of floor there's a lot of floors underneath this. You know, you're right. You're right. I agree. It's, but I would put this to John. I put this question to John. Um, if indeed you know when looking at where where levels are things are going to be safe um, and 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 do a turn. And I just forgot my question, John. Please forgive me. My brain's moving faster than my mouth. Um, but going back to what what Jim just said, that how would you fit that all into relieving people's fear. So what's the question? The question seems to be fire. like, at, at what do you think uh, will occur uh, that will alleviate fears? Would it be the cases? Uh, only one thing, yeah. Corona cases, right. uh, first of all in China and then here, right. and people will read that as the bottom of the market. Right. And, and, then, it, and then it is totally so agree. over, and then it is so oversold that it's, uh, it bounces from there. Difference. By the way, they just, Canada just closed all its borders to non-citizens. Are we got a few minutes left here? I just wanted to to uh, see if we could go around the horn here and uh, give us uh, maybe three sectors that you would put on your shopping list uh, if you are going to try to look for something between now and the end of June, using that as a very wide time frame, uh, where you'd like to, uh, you know, pick things up. You know, uh, you know, uh, John has mentioned technology as one area. So uh, give me three, three areas, three uh, sectors, uh, uh, Neil, that you think would be uh, something to accumulate when and if this thing can hit a low. I think when, when the market drops a fair amount and the strongest, the companies that were the strongest before the drop usually lead it back up. But if the market drops an, an insane amount, that's when you can really start bottom fishing. So, I mean, people regret not buying Apple in 2008. I regret not buying Croc, Pier 1 Import. Do you have any idea how much those things went up? I think Pier 1 Imports was at something like 17 cents and went up to 45 bucks, if I recall. <laughs> so <laughs> look for something yeah. like that. I'm seriously not joking. Look for something crazy like Crocs or, uh, you know, those those funny shoes or, or things like that. But if I want to go more on it. So a you're looking at things that go into single digits or even uh, pennies. pennies. I, I mean, do you really think those little stands where you buy those silly shoes are going out of business actually? No, right. Yeah. I mean, I'm also looking at Cheesecake Factory because I freaking love that restaurant and mutual funds used to take me there for free. <laughs> um, but I'm actually thinking that housing is going to rebound and Trump's a builder. He loves low rates. Uh, the low rates from the last 10 years made him super rich. And so I'm going to look at um, some of the things like maybe Freeport McMoran. I'm going to look at U.S. Steel, which is at five dollars. It was over 100 many years ago. Um, I think that mortgage rates will be at record lows. And here's the one thing if anyone in this White House administration has studied history, because I came across something recently, all of you may know that these millennials are left wing socialists now, right? And they've never had a job and they go to college. And what are they teaching in college? They don't teach you Adam Smith, the Wealth Nations. Never was I assigned that book for reading, but I had to do a, a report on why communism doesn't work called Tragedy of the Commons. Um, I never wrote, I never read that despicable book written by Karl Marx because I think it's despicable, but um, unreadable anyway. You know, the government has to stop these millennials from being socialist left-wing crazies. And what happened after World War II in Germany was in West Germany, people were moving to voting socialist and stuff, right? right? And so the conservative government, I don't even know what they're called back then, but they had to figure out why this was happening. And it was because house prices were too high. And if, I mean, if you have a house, your mortgage payment's not that much, your medical's not that much, not going to double under socialism like Obama made it happen and the huge profits of the medical company. Companies. But if you have a lot of leftover money, people go, hey, you want to vote left wing? And you say, why? You know, 30 years old, I got three grand like, every month left over. Why bother, right? So they have to make housing affordable for young people. Right. And if they drop rates, I mean, you could drop the 30 year rate to 2%, yeah. right? That's no, you can buy a $300,000 house for a grand and everybody's got a grand to do 
that. So that you're right about that. Yeah, they have to do it. If they don't do it, America's going left. Yeah. All right, right, so let's uh, let's uh, keep the pace real quick here. We got housing and tech out of you, plus uh, the stocks that go to a single digits or even below one that have a big name to them. And really that's uh, the, that those are the three areas you're going to look at, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, let's uh, swing it over to uh, uh, to John. And John, do you have three uh, three neighborhoods you like? Yeah. Google, Microsoft, and Apple. Yeah, you're right. They all have the biggest cash balances, the biggest buyback programs, the best balance sheets. They led to the upside last time. They're going to continue to do that for another 10 years. You know, even on its best day, uh, Apple only got up to a market multiple, right. only got up to 20 times and spent the rest of the last 10 years cheap under the multiple. So, and, fi- and 5G in the cloud is not going away. And those are the big players in that area. If anything, the virus is accelerating the move to right. online commerce. Right. All Would you throw Amazon in there too, or do you think uh, yes, consumer spending? Hmm? Yes, I would. Okay, so that would be the I four would. horsemen: uh, Google, Apple, uh, Amazon, and Microsoft. That would be the place to, you know, maybe uh, start picking things up when you think. Yeah. Uh, well, the while stuff. you guys were talking, I've been on Amazon buying pasta because all the stores are out of it. You can't get anywhere, but Amazon still has access to food. I just hope you don't get diarrhea because there's no toilet paper out there anymore. Oh, don't worry. That's the first thing we got. We have enough <laughs> uh, toilet paper for the Armageddon. Uh, all right, uh, Michael, close us up with uh, three sectors uh, or three ideas that you might like um, as this thing uh, unfolds. I think semiconductors, number one. I think that consumer uh, products, number two, but very limited. So I would be more inter- interested in Amazon, you know, the online uh, retail. Right. I think I don't think people will go to the stores, but I think that they'll go there. Uh, Microsoft, love it. Love Microsoft. So I'd let it come down, let it do what it's got to do for this. But as if we are indeed going to be in a recovery, Recovery. I think Microsoft is well positioned to do that. I would stay away from the all-time faves like Facebook, Netflix, uh, Nvidia. I would take a look at, but it depends on how much they bring off versus you know reality. Um, a lot of cash. Yeah, yeah, I would. I would not go for car makers. I would stay away from a lot of uh, the other sectors. I would definitely not go with utilities right, right. now. Um, so I, I best. I think I'm going to stick with like like Jim, Apple, Advanced Micro, Amazon, and Microsoft. Okay. Those are all pretty, pretty dealt with. Yeah. I think, I, I mean, I'll toss it on a sub-level bank. You know, if we yeah. do recover, so will they. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're at the top of the hour now. So, Neil, uh, just a, a quick uh, idea to everybody on how to reach you. And if you have any special offers, this is a great time to extend them. Yeah, sure. Uh, just go to my website, uh, traderreview.net. Sign up for my newsletter there. And, um, yeah, I give some free reports. And, um, and if you sign up to be a private client, I also teach you how I time all the market collapses using a point and figure charting. That sounds great. Okay. TraderReview.net. Uh, John, over to you. How can people reach you and uh, anything you want to extend? I'm at www.madhedgefundtrader.com. Go to our homepage. We have a free research product for <laughs> entry-level uh, subscribers and traders. We cover all asset classes, stocks, bonds, commodities, precious metals, energy, and real estate. And all of them are looking incredibly interesting right now. So again, madhedgefundtrader.com. Look forward to working with you. I and Mike, one- Michael, yeah. Yes. Just real quick, yeah. um, uh, go and find out if you can get a second mortgage on your house and use it for a down payment on another house because in the next 10 years, house prices can go up at least 50% in inflation. Because yeah, of the low, the low interest rate environment. Time. All right, Michael, real quick to you. Um, again, how can people get a hold of you over at uh, Logical Signals and uh, any offers to extend? I um, I don't have any offers to extend right now, but stay tuned because there might be one coming. And I put both of my email addresses in uh, in the chat box. It's Michael at MJF1, and that's the number one, partners.com, and also Michael at LogicalSignals.com. So, okay. And I do answer emails, and I'd be more than more than happy to receive what people are thinking, what people are wanting to do, uh, just so that we get a more general idea. It's like, what's happening? Out there? Sure, and that's good. Uh, I'm Jim Kenny, and uh, Option Professor, uh, you can reach me at optionprofessor at gmail.com. I have a weekly uh, update on my opinion and my observations, so if you'd like to get uh, queued up on that uh, weekly report, uh, just uh, hit us over at optionprofessor at gmail.com. Right now, we went over the thing a little bit, but not too 
bid. I think we covered a lot and we could always obviously talk all day on these things because the news is just all over the place. So I want to thank everybody for being here. And again, I'm going to turn it right now over to David. Yeah, lots well, of good information today. So thanks, guys. Uh, just a quick reminder to everyone, uh, be sure to subscribe to Timing Research on YouTube and your favorite podcast directory to get all of uh, get all of our updates. And you can also go to timingresearch.com, get access to uh, the recording of this show as soon as I can get it posted and any of the past shows and reports. So I just want to thank my guest again for today one more time, Neil Batho of TraderReview.net, Michael Filigera of LogicalSignals.com, John Thomas of MadHedgeFundTrader.com, and uh, Jim, the Option Professor at OptionProfessor.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, David. Thank you.